audience. We are extremely thankful to have Caroline Golnick here. She is going to be a very special treat. Um, she, we've been working with her at the Health Hut for a while. She will tell you about her certifications, um, but I just want you to know just how, what a gift this is. And I'm glad you're here for it tonight. And you will want to take notes and watch the video afterwards and share it with all your friends that have kids at home. So Caroline, please come up and thank you for being here, my dear. All right. Hello, hi everybody. Good evening. I am Caroline Golmick, and I have um, a practice in Owen City called Terrain Natural Health. And so over the last couple of years, I've been a frequent flyer at the Health Hut in, uh, here in Chippewa. And my son, I have a two and a half year old son. And if you have not yet been to the Health Hut in Chippewa, you need to go, especially if you have little ones, because they have a small cart that makes it extra fun for them to walk around the store, find the treats that they love. And he walks into the place like he owns the place at this point. Um, so if you have not been in to the Health Hut, they're a blessing to our community for a number of reasons. One, they are an abundance of education and wisdom to this community doing things like this for us. They're a small family owned Christian run company. And so for those reasons, I know that there are all sorts of places we can be getting great options for our health. Why not keep it local? Why not buy it from people that we know in our own community and um, people that we can trust? And so that's my plug to the health hub because we love the health hub. Spend way too much money there, I just know. <laughs> okay, so Terrain Natural Health. I have a couple of certifications I had told Kelly, um, or Kelly mentioned. I am a certifi certified natural health professional as well as a certified holistic health practitioner. So I work with clients who have chronic health issues, um, who maybe are fed up with the medical system, maybe they're not fed up and they're just looking for someone to walk alongside that path with them and that routine, and maybe they're having acute symptoms. I have a whole, a whole variety of people that have come in, and I just had my 200th consultation last week. I opened in January of this year, and I'll be sharing a little bit of my story um, throughout our talk here tonight. But um, I would love to first start by opening in prayer, if that's okay with all of you. Father God, thank you for just an opportunity to come together with your children and share of your goodness and your creation and to just build one another up in love and hope and empowerment. Thank you for the miraculous way that you created us, God, and um, I just pray that you give us ears to hear tonight. Holy Spirit, just give me every word to say so that I can communicate uh, your word effectively. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So the purpose of Train Natural Health is to spread the good word that's on my shirt, which is you are well made. And I think it is exactly the message that's needed right now with everything that's going on around us. We have a message of fear around us, of hopelessness, and what we need is a little bit of jarring to remind us that we were created by the creator of the universe. And when we get all of the things we need for our mind, our body, and our spiritual health, our body can heal itself. It's capable of miraculous things when we get what we need. And so that's the whole purpose of having the practice to begin with. Um, and I'll be, like I said, I'll be weaving some of my family's own story in tonight. But I wanted to start with, you're well made. That was pulled, <laughs> I um, stole that from Psalm 139, 13 through 16, if you're familiar. And what it says is, for you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, created. Fearfully, so when you look that up, it says awe, reverence, astonishment, Wonderfully meaning wonders, beyond human comprehension, miraculous. When you start thinking about what that really means when it comes down to our creation and what we are, and you start thinking, I have aches and pains, and I kind of feel like I have headaches all the time, or I just feel sluggish. I'm here to tell you that is not what, how you were designed to feel. We were designed to thrive, to have an overflow of love, and joy and excitement and health to be able to share and express to those around us. 
And so if, we're not, if you're not feeling that right now, now is your time from this day forward to make a shift. And a great thing, I try not to go off on too many tangents, but the great thing is our bones, our bone marrow makes our blood. And it makes our blood out of what we've put into our system over the last 24 hours. So for the last 24 hours, if you've really been beating yourself up with a whole bunch of cruddy food and alcohol and soda pop, certainly you're not gonna feel well today and tomorrow. But the great thing is every day you replace a little bit of that blood. So by the time we are 75, 90 days ahead from right now, new year, you can feel like a brand new person because no longer are your organs being covered by blood that has been tainted by the crud that we've been giving it. Okay, so that was a bit of a tangent there. It's just a reminder that you can turn your health around so fast if you start now. It just takes a decision to say, I'm ready to get moving in this journey. And it will be baby steps. And you're not gonna do it all at once and you're not going to be perfect. I always tell my clients, you do not need to get an A plus on this. On some things, you ought to stick in the A range, like drinking enough water. Eating real food, if you can get like a B minus on that, even a C plus, so many of us are operating at an F. We're literally not fueling ourselves and then we wonder why we feel like a car that's out of gasoline and that's because we're not fueling ourselves. And so you don't have to be perfect here. A reminder that we were not created with deficiencies. We were perfectly created in the image of God. And he told us that he gave us plants and trees as our food and our medicine. And I think what's happened is we've begun to doubt that truth in our lives, that what we eat and what we consume will actually affect the way that we feel. And I'm telling you all this because I know the topic of today is how we're sabotaging our children's health, but the truth is how we treat ourselves and our own health is being picked up on a lot more than we think. More is caught than taught, they say, right? So your children, your grandchildren, your nieces, your nephews, if you have a child in your life, they're always watching. Right? They're, the Monsters Inc. movie, they're watching, they were always watching. They are always watching you. And so if they watch you consistently taking care of yourself, taking time for yourself to put things in play that are beneficial to your overall health of mind and body and spirit, they will learn to incorporate those habits into their life too. The second scripture that I wanted to talk with you about tonight is probably my favorite scripture because it's been a consistent source of both grace and conviction for me over the years, and it's Romans 12, 1 and 2. I'm sure a lot of you already know it. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. That is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you can test and approve what God's will is for your life, his good, pleasing, and perfect will challenge central there um his mercy i mean in view of god's mercy in view of his he gave his one and only son to die on a cross for our sins in view of that mercy what he's asking for us is to take our life and the way we're living it and use it as a sacrifice honoring and pleasing to him and i'm going to reference the message version of this scripture because sometimes if you read the bible and you feel like it's over my head read it again and again and then ask the lord to open your eyes. But also, sometimes it helps just to pull it up in a different translation. And every once in a while, I really like the message version, and this is specifically for this one. So the message version of Romans 12, 1 and 2 is, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you that's always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you. He develops well-formed maturity in you. Oh, I love it. I have a little poster up in our house that says this. Take your every day, you're eating, you're drinking, you're working, and place it before God as an offering. Everything we do is an offering to the Lord. If we truly believe that we're well made, for those of us that know Jesus, we believe that he lives in our heart and we, the, Holy temp, the Holy Spirit resides in our temple, how dare we trash this temple? And so I'm saying this in grace and love, no condemnation here today because none of us are perfect. We're all idiots. 
who sinners. <laughs> um, but we've all been saved by the grace of God. And so um, I just encourage you to listen with some open ears today and just pick out a few small changes that may, may, might make sense for you and might make sense for your family and will definitely benefit your children as well. Okay. Three steps to healing. I'm going to start here because it will be woven throughout um, the stories that I share. When I'm meeting with a client, after watching my husband miraculously heal, and I will share about it, um, I found that the three steps to healing, whether it's an issue that you're having mentally or physically or spiritually, it is step one, to pray and believe for healing. Step two is to commit to radical life change. And step three is to separate yourself from your diagnosis. I have found that step three tends to be the most difficult of them. Um, yes, it's not easy to transition how you eat and drink and sleep and all the ways you live. It's not easy to truly trust and believe that we can be healed by the creator. But step three, where you finally take off this robe of what you've been wearing around. And like I said, it doesn't have to just be a physical ailment. Maybe it is. Maybe you've had back pain your whole life and you think, I'm just always going to have back pain. It's just this thing I have. And that's just the way it is. And it just happened to me. I had nothing to do with it. And I can't possibly resolve it. But it might be something that's mental. Maybe you grew up in an abusive house and there that is sitting with you. And you know what? After so many years, we tend to wear that as like a cloak of comfort. So much so that it becomes a part of your identity. And when you meet somebody new and they say, how are you doing? The first thing you talk about is this hurt thing that you have going on in your life. And so separating from that specific diagnosis that sometimes we have self-diagnosed is the most important part. And so I'm sharing that because my husband, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit of his story now because it's what brought me to this point in my life. I sold insurance for 11 years, but two years into my marriage, um, my husband made some radical life change in regards to his health and he's now symptom and medication free six years later. He was diagnosed with Crohn's disease when he was 10 which is an autoimmune condition, and it's in the GI tract, and so he had diarrhea, he had bloody stools, he missed months and months and months of school, all through high school, and it just really wrecked his coming of age for a young boy. And his family was beside themselves, and we didn't know everything we know now then, and so despite his parents doing the best thing that they could advocate for him, there were times when they would talk to the doctor and say, you know, should we cut cereal from his breakfast? Should we... Um, add vitamins into his daily regimen and they said you can't change this with lifestyle change you can't cure Crohn's disease so that's that's where that's um, that's what they were surrounded with was that kind of conversation so they advocated and advocated and advocated and they finally found a drug that was an infusion that he would get every eight weeks for two hours it was at um, he it was billed to our insurance as low-dose chemotherapy, and by the time we were married, he was on it for 13 years. And you know how the spirit works in you sometimes. It just starts this little stirring in your gut. And I felt like when we first got married, this can't be a great idea that he's infusing this low-dose chemotherapy into his system every eight weeks, and we may decide or desire children someday. And so I would start bringing up this conversation, and I would just pray, God, I don't know anything, but if you could, I need resources or something to show us a way, some type of freedom out of this life that he's been living. And, you know, God shows up when you ask him to. And so I was online and I would find these stories, very specific stories of other women who were trying to help their husbands get off of this medication because they were family planning. Almost to the point where you're like, am I reading my own story? And it gave me hope is what it did, is, is hearing that other people had achieved this through lifestyle change gave us hope. And then we got connected with a naturopath. And we told her, you know, we're desiring to make this lifestyle change. Would you help guide us through that? And she did. And so she said, we're like, how long are we gonna have to do this? Sleep's pretty tight to change, clean up our diet and take all these supplements. And she said, can you give it three months? And we're like, three months, that's so long. And she's like, do you want to get well? Uh, it was a Zoom consultation because she lives a few hours away. And we're looking at each other like, you know, she's being rude. And she's like, truly, do you want to get well? Because if you do, then three months in the grand scope of the rest of your life is nothing. And so it's up to you. I'm not going to tell you you have to do it. If you want to do it and you want to commit to it, it'll probably take about that long for your body to start being able to heal itself from all of these years of you beating it up. 
And so we committed. So we committed to three months, which ended up turning into closer to a year, closer to a year, and he stepped out of the hospital. We prayed and we believed for healing. So first of all, we made some radical life change from the life he was living. Because sometimes whenever you're taking a medication, it becomes like you're just pulling the batteries out of a fire alarm. Yes, you don't hear the blaring anymore, but it doesn't mean the fire's out. And eventually that fire is going to come out through the windows and through the roof and it's going to burn the house down. And so when we just continue to suppress symptoms, we're only suppressing it for the moment. And sometimes we're suppressing what our body is trying to tell us, that something is off and it needs attention. And so he would eat. When we first got married, he was eating sleeves of Oreos at a time because this medication made him feel like, I'm fine. I have no problem eating these sleeves of Oreos. <laughs> it's not harmful to me. Uh, so obviously we had to make some major, major life change at that point. We went into the, his GI doctor to tell him our desires, and they tried round by round by round to talk us out of it. You can't cure this. Diet and exercise is not going to be enough. Lifestyle change. You can't cure Crohn's disease. Diet's not enough. They sent their nutritionist in from, or their dietitian in from UPMC to try to talk us out of it, but we had already, we were in for battle. We had resources, and everything was highlighted. I had my computer, and we were not walking out without an answer of, were being released as if we thought it was not our, our choice. It was our choice anyway. Um, so we walked out that day, and I'll never forget, it was Valentine's Day, and he said, I'm done with Crohn's disease. And it was like the last piece of the healing process fell off of him, and he never looked back. And that was hard for him because growing up with Crohn's disease, it was the first thing, tell me something interesting about yourself. He would say, I have Crohn's disease. He was a camper at Crohn's camp. He was a counselor at Crohn's camp with other kids who had the similar diagnosis. He was on the front of Crohn's and Colitis Foundation magazine because he was a poster child for, the, for a cute kid who was going through a drug that was seemingly working for him. So it really did become all parts of him. So to finally say, I'm done with Crohn's disease was a huge step for him. And like I said, that was the final step. We prayed and believed, we committed to radical life change, and then he separated from his diagnosis and he never looked back. If you flash forward a little bit, or flash, flash back a little bit into his childhood, what you would find is what I'm now seeing over and over and over, and I bet Kelly and Jen would say they see the same thing at the Health Hut, is children coming in, the system of ear infections, which leads to antibiotic use. Antibiotic use, which wears down the gut lining. The gut lining is in prime. It's almost like, um, has everyone played Jenga before? Okay, so you stack all the, the blocks, right? Jenga blocks and then you take turns removing one block at a time to see who will topple over the Jenga tower. It's almost like, okay, ear infection, stem, no one ever tried to get to the source of that. Ear infection was some type of allergy to something, whether it was one of his vaccinations when he was a kid or maybe it was some dairy and something that he was eating. That was like a little piece of a Jenga block being taken out. Antibiotic, another one, another one, another one. Antibiotics, back and forth, back and forth. Ear infection, antibiotics. Then when he was 10, and we have this information because his mom kept very precise journals of his growing up, which has been a true gift um, for me now looking back. He had the hepatitis B vaccine when he was 10. They used to give it when you were 10. Now they give it to you on your first day of birth. That's for um, if someone uses needles or sexually transmitted disease. So why we give it to someone on the first day of birth makes no sense. Why we give it to a 10 year old doesn't really make a whole lot of sense either. But when he got that, that week is the first week that stool started sh uh, blood started showing up in his stool, which eventually led to his Crohn's disease diagnosis. Was it specifically from that shot? It was the last Jang piece for his system so that it became so confused that it could not separate self from invader, and that's what autoimmune disease is. And knowing that helps us then make decisions moving forward. So when my husband was taking this Remicade, I, I urge you, anything you're taking internally, digesting, injecting, look at the product insert. It always comes with what you're taking. And in there you'll find ingredients, adverse reactions, uh, side effects. And whenever Scott's, I wish I had it, he threw it away. But it was his Remicade um, product insert and it opened up to be as large as our dining room table when it came in the mail. And the number one huge warning is one, infection is an issue because we're suppressing your immune system, and two, was lymphoma. And they actually no longer give it to that age group of boys, this specific drug. It was an experimental drug at that point because they know it's causing lymphoma, it's causing cancer in these children. So I got very good at learning and reading these product inserts. So I'm sharing this with you because that's where most of our children's stories begin, is with that cycle, and I'm seeing it more and more and more. 
We have ear infections because when you're having an allergy to something. We have an over-prescribed antibiotic use, which breaks down the gut lining, which then leads and opens us up to food allergies, eczema, autoimmune conditions. That's why we're seeing such a huge burst in this is for this very reason, amongst others. So when I was pregnant, uh, 28 weeks, when you're 28 weeks, they ask you to get a Tdap and a flu shot. So Tdap is your tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis. And I asked, would there be any side effects to these injections? And I, I was at the Midwife Center in Pittsburgh, and they said, well, you might have a sore arm. And again, it was that little stirring, just something. I needed to know more. I didn't know enough, that's how I felt, and I also knew because of what we had gone through with my husband that I could pull up the product inserts, and that's what I did. I went home, I told them I'd like to wait. I went home, I pulled them up, and found that they've never been tested on pregnant women or the fetus, ever. Which was enough of an answer for me that I believe in my creation. I know that when I support my system as it was designed, it can heal itself, and tend to itself, and you cannot inject health. You can't inject health into your body. And Again, my purpose for sharing that with you is because, again, not condemnation or, or anything of that nature, just more of when you know better, you do better. And I'm encouraging everyone to question the status quo. There are many choices that we don't know we have as new parents that unless you go digging yourself, and you're welcome to reach out to me. My cards are on the back um, table. If you don't desire consultation, that's fine. Find me on Facebook, send me a private message. I'll send you many resources that led us to the decisions that we made with our child. We went through an eight-week boot camp, we read many books, we watched movies, we educated ourselves because the information at this point, even though it's more heavily censored now than it was two and a half years ago, it's still available. And so if you're interested, I can send you the information that led us um, to the decisions that we made. Okay, let's talk a little bit about, I don't wanna go too deep into some of this, Science. So I'll try to keep it brief and then we'll see what our time is like. I just want to um, be respectful of everyone's time here. So our children, how do we turn these toxins that come into our system, whether it be from the air, from the water, from antibiotics, medications, vaccinations, our body was designed to convert those toxins through our liver. And I really think if school really wanted to teach us anything, that they would teach us about our liver from like ABC, one, two, three, here's how your liver works, because it's so important. And it's also the top of the chain of the waterfall of reactions that happen in our system. When our liver is not operating appropriately, all of a sudden our kidney has to do additional work that it was not designed to do. And then that falls to your lymphatic system and eventually to your lungs. And your lungs are designed only to expel CO2. That's called respiration. And when your liver is not working to capacity, and your kidneys aren't, and it falls down, eventually you're start trying to expel toxins that your lungs were not designed to expel. And so of course, what you end up feeling when you have a congested liver is this constant state of inflammation up here. So you almost feel like you have allergies all the time. That's a good indicator that you need to support your liver. What I wanted to mention with the children is, most children don't develop the ability to translate fat soluble toxins into water soluble, that's what our liver does one of the jobs it does. It takes fat soluble toxins, converts them to water soluble so that we can remove it through our waste or our urine. But that doesn't happen until children are about 10 years old. So what is happening to these small bodies whenever they're having to work through all of these toxins at a very young age is those toxins are circulating somewhere and a lot of times they cross the blood brain barrier and they settle there. So we have to think a little bit differently when it comes to the idea of my child is not feeling well, I'm running straight to the doctor for a pill because that pill will have a byproduct that their liver has to work through. And now all of a sudden, in a time when their body needs all of the help and support it can get, we're overloading it with something that we think is benefiting them. And so we'll talk through the actual foundations of where your health comes from. And I can tell you it doesn't come from a vaccination, it doesn't come from a medication, and it definitely doesn't come from isolation. It comes from you focusing on the foundations of your own health because your health is your responsibility. Your children's health is also your responsibility until a certain age. But it's not the responsibility of your neighbor and it's not the responsibility of your doctor to keep you well, it's up to you. And so kudos to all of you for being here and kudos to Kelly and Jen for putting this out to the community for you to get an opportunity to learn what your health actually is in ways that you can support it. 
Okay, so I'm, I'll mention it now. I'm writing a little bit of a curriculum. It's called Terraining Camp. You get it? Terrain, natural health. And it's basically the steps to health. And so I'm going to walk through what those are with you. We'll veer off in some directions, but I'm sharing that with you because the same steps that help you stay healthy will also keep your children healthy. And terrain, which I, like, I should also mention is, so terrain natural health, the name came from terrain theory. So there's two theories when it comes to health. And I've seen a great illustration, maybe you have too, where there's a fish in a fish bowl. And the, the goal is protect the fish from the growing bacteria, the viruses, the algae that will eventually grow on the inside of that bowl. Germ theory, which is what our Western medicine all works off of right now, would say, put that little fish in a little baggie, isolate it from the germs and the bacteria and the viruses, keep them hidden, and give them some medicine. Then he won't have to worry. Hide from the germ, basically. Terrain theory is we have trillions of germs and bacteria and viruses in, on, and around us at all times. You cannot hide from the germ. So the best way to protect that fish would be keep the inside of the bowl clean. Clean it up once a day. That's our systems. We don't have to fear the germ or the virus or the bacteria, no matter what the name of that virus is, if we are paying attention to our own terrain. And when our inner environment in our body finds balance, it can heal itself. You don't have to fear the world around you when you're paying proper attention to your overall health of mind, body, and spirit. Okay, so step one, because you're gonna say like, duh, to this one, but it's not happening for most of us. Drink more water. We have to drink more water. When it comes to our children, that can get difficult um, because we're not with them all day at school. And if they're under six months, certain, I mean, there's some ages, obviously. I'm, I'm kind of talking to preschool age and up here. Younger than that, they should be having breast milk and little teeny bits of water whenever they're younger. But let's talk preschool and up. We should all be drinking half of our body weight in ounces of water. If you're nowhere near that, start small, add little bits each day, each week until you grow there. We don't want to overwhelm your kidneys. But most of us, the issues that we have, if you spent the next 30 days drinking enough water, a lot of your issues would resolve themselves because you're now bringing oxygen and nutrients to your cell. And your cells, that's the goal of everything we do. What we eat, what we drink, what we breathe is to bring oxygen, life to the cell. Water is one of the ways we do that. Water is also one of the ways we flush waste out of our system. And so if you look at your urine and it's bright orange or it's bubbly, or it's pungent and smell, that's a good indicator that you need more water. So what can you do? Divide your body weight in half, figure out what half of your body weight is, get your kid a water bottle that they love. I, mine is so beat, because <laughs> I carry this everywhere I go. It is so beat up. I don't necessarily love it, but it meets the trick for me. I know I need to drink two of these every single day, so that's my goal. Before you have a cup of coffee in the morning, drink two cups of water, make that your goal. If it's your child, again, find, let them pick it out. Find a cool water bottle that they love, figure out how many they need to drink in the day, and make that your sole goal. There will be some shifting in this. You'll have to start having this conversation with your kids, but the best part is, it gives you an opportunity to have these conversations with your children about why we drink water. And <laughs> this might be TMI for some of you, too much information, but my two and a half year old son, we know every time he poops, we look at his poop and we talk about what that's telling us because you're poop and your pee tell you everything about what's going on internally. So if you have little marbles of poop in the, the toilet, you need more water. You're dehydrated and you're probably moving pretty slow through your system. So now you're at a greater chance of reabsorbing toxins into your bloodstream and you become toxic. If it's always diarrhea, that tells us we're probably having either an allergic reaction to something we're a little bit too acidic. We're having an inflammation in our GI tract. So it tells us everything we need to know, and then you can adjust accordingly. So look at your poop tonight after you go to the bathroom. No laughs? Nothing? Okay, great. <laughs> it is, thank you for that. Um, it is hard to make shifts in our everyday choices. It's hard to make time to make food. It's hard to make time to figure out and nag your children to drink their water. But it is also hard to feel terrible all the time and to feel tired all the time and to have a bellyache all the time and to be constipated for days on end. They're both hard. So pick your hard because they're both difficult, but one of them leads to extra life for you and one of them leads to building your whole life around 
doctor's appointments eventually, and I know that's not the future I want for myself or my family. So what you can do now is put the time and the energy and the changes in now, and it might be radical life change for you, but I promise you it will be worth it. So step one, drink more water. Step two, also you're gonna say duh, but it's probably the most difficult of all of them is eat more real food. Our children need to eat more real food, but we need to eat more real food because they're like more likely to do as we do than to do as we say. And I had written this down because I, I like the phrase, it is often less important for parents to control their children's behavior than it is for them to control their own. So in other words, it's more important for you to be able to get yourself in order than it is to make sure your kid's life is in order because they'll learn from you. And when you start figuring out ways to actually apply life change to yourself, it'll be a whole lot easier to help your child adapt that too. And then you stop having certain things in the house, then no one's eating it. And ultimately you have the control. We can't let the prisoners run the, what do they say? I can't let the inmates run the prison. We can't let our children rule the roost. We have control over what's in the house. Um, and I'm gonna give you a couple of recommendations on some easier ways to help our children adjust to this lifestyle change. Something to keep in mind is most commercially prepared baby food and snacks are high in salt, they're high in sugar, chemical preservatives, colors, and flavors. And when we expose young children to this over and over at a young age, we're telling their brain to start creating neural pathways that make them want that food. So we also then have that opposite opportunity to give their brains the opportunity to build neural pathways that they desire, fruits and vegetables and water. And then what happens is the more they eat of that, the, I mean, I feel like if you gave my kid a juice box right now, he would be like, what is this? Because his little pathways are now being created to have part cherry juice watered down from the health hut or coconut water juice. That's his, his most exciting purchase from the health hut. Or I give him some of my greens each day. That's the juice that his brain is now developing around is this taste of actual food and actual 100% concentrate juice as opposed to heavily watered down, high fructose corn syrup, sugary um, carbonated, carbonated beverages. So something I recommend is you choose what the child eats, they choose when and how much. That especially works for my child's age range, toddlerhood. I will put food out and he can graze. I would love for him to sit with me at every meal. Most of the time he will. will. Sometimes he does not want to sit and I'm not going to wrangle him. What I care about is that he is eating enough real food each day to fuel his body so that he has energy to be awake, that he doesn't have belly aches, that he's never constipated, doesn't get ear infections, and that he sleeps well through the night. That's my goal for him is to support his system in a way so he can thrive. So you can do the same. You pick what they eat, they choose when and how much. Something that I have also found helpful is if you create a little drawer, either in the pantry and or the refrigerator, with their name on it, put their name on it, you pick everything that goes in that little drawer. So maybe it's bagged up blueberries, carrot sticks, watermelon, maybe you make some yummy, delicious treat that you put one or two of them in there. And then throughout the day when they're hungry, they know I'm going to the refrigerator, I'm pulling out my little pack and I can pick anything out of there that I want. And I would do the same thing with the pantry. So a great start is go, if you haven't been, go to the health go to the back row of the store in here in Chippewa and say, you can pick three non-GMO, we're gonna talk about that, non-GMO organic treats. Let them be free, pick out three, put them in the bag, take them home. When, as soon as you get home, get little baggies and break it up into five or six or seven servings and put that in their little bucket that you put in the pantry for them. So that when the hankering comes for them and they want a snack, they go straight in. No longer are you serving them something that has been sprayed with poison, that is made from something that was manufactured in a lab, and that is going to essentially make them feel a lot worse off than when they started eating. Give them something that will be somewhat nourishing to their soul. It might change your budget. Again, we're either gonna pay for our health now or we're going to pay for our health later. So you get to choose when that is. And I would like to pay for a little bit more on the front end. So that's what we do. He, it's not that my son never gets a chip or a pretzel, it's that when he does, he's getting a gluten-free, non-GMO, organic pretzel or chip. And he's not eating as many because I'm not rich. So I put them in little baggies and he can pick and choose as he pleases. 
I know what he likes. He'll eat blueberries, he'll eat grapes if I cut them in half and I bag them. Do I want to do that all the time? No, but I know my son will eat grapes if I cut them in half and I put them in little baggies. So am I going to do it? Yes, because I would prefer that over him wanting to turn to animal crackers every time that he's hungry. And now he likes them because he's developed a desire for real food in his mouth, fresh food. Okay, GMOs, let's talk about it. Um, so Kelly had asked that I just touch on this and for whatever reason I didn't have it included in here before but it's pretty obvious now that I start talking about it that GMOs are genetically modified foods. They were literally made in a lab and the whole back, we could have a two hour talk just on why this exists, what happened to the farms, why the seeds now are also genetically modified, why so many of the things we're eating are no longer real. They've been literally manufactured. So what we're looking for is non-GMO certified organic on some of these packages. But the reason why they do it, in part, is because we like to buy pretty foods and we want to have all foods available to us at all times, despite what the weather is and despite what our area would normally nourish out of the ground. And so what they've done is, for one example, a watermelon. Has anyone in here ever grown a watermelon? Well done. It comes out round, right? When you buy it at the store, they tend to be elongated, almost with a flat top, and they've, they've been bred that way for stacking purposes. It's easier to stack them in the trucks, and we want all the watermelon we want, when we want it, and we want it to look pretty, and we don't want seeds in it. So when they do that, then they've bred it to be a certain way so they can get it to us. Another one is tomatoes. We don't like bruised tomatoes. We want pretty plump red tomatoes. Anyone that's grown them in your garden knows that they come in a variety of looks and fashions, but when we buy them at the store, we want them to be perfect. So what they've actually done is they want them to be able to survive freezing conditions. So they have taken some DNA of fish that live in very cold water and they've crossbred that with the tomato seed so that the tomato can withstand freezing temperatures and not completely die off. This is what we're eating. This is not the food of your parents, your grandparents' days. The nutritional value of the food we're eating now, I just read a study on broccoli, it's like 40% less nutritional value than it was in the 60s. And it's not getting any better. And so the next step after eating real food, I'm gonna stick in the food for a little bit longer, but the next step after that is supplement your deficiencies. No longer is it, oh, maybe you need to take a multivitamin, maybe you need to take this or that. Almost everybody is deficient in something because our food is no longer nourishing us as well as it once was, nor are we eating enough real food that even if it was nourishing us, we are all about convenience now. And so we've adapted to convenience lifestyle. We want the quick grab on the run. And instead of that being a little baggie of grapes, many of us have turned to cereal, chips, cookies. But supplement your deficiencies is, is the next step in the health process. Drink more water, eat real food. Step three is supplement your deficiencies. We are expecting our kids to excel in school and we wonder why they're tired or they're sluggish or they're not sleeping well when we send them off to school after a big bowl of sugary cereal. Literally no nutritional value in that at all and then we just can't understand why they're not achieving what we know they're capable of achieving. And it's because they're like, we're like sending them out into a car that has no gasoline in it and expecting it to make it for a two hour drive. That's not going to happen. So we have to adjust our lifestyle. You have to lead the charge as the parent or the grandparent in the life of your child to make that happen. And it might be uncomfortable a little bit at first to do that, but I will tell you again, it will be well worth it to you. The acronym is CRAP. We drink a lot of crap eat a lot of crap. C is carbonated drinks and caffeine, hard on our kidneys. R is refined sugar. A is artificial sweeteners, artificial colors, and alcohol. And then P is processed foods. And that makes up our sad standard American sad diet. And then we wonder why we're literally sad. We have anxiety, depression, our emotional we're like on an emotional roller coaster as a society right now. How many people are on anti-anxiety medication? When the answer is right in front of our nose, and the answer is we need to nourish our body so that it can survive as it was designed. I will truly have some clients sit down in front of me and say they drink a cup of water plus three or four cups of coffee a day, and I think we had to have been created by a miraculous creator because the fact that you're not sitting here looking like a raisin, a shriveled up raisin in front of me is miraculous. 
So imagine how you could feel if you can function all day long on one cup of water and three cups of coffee. Imagine how much better you will feel if you woke up and you had two cups of water before your one cup of coffee and then you had a smoothie that had greens and real food in it and some water. All of a sudden you're like, a plant, a sunflower that's emerging and looking up at the sun. That's what we need to be doing for ourselves. And when we don't feel well, make a shift, make a shift. Can't keep doing what they say. Insanity is when you do the same thing over and over and expect a different result. It's not going to happen. Okay. A couple other recommendations for how we can get our children to eat the food. Have them play a role in planning meals. Maybe you pick 10, 12, 15 meals that you're willing to make for a week and let them pick out the five that you want to have for dinner that week. Two, have them play a role in prepping it. There's something about the touching of and the cutting of and the seeing of the ingredients that are going into the meal that make you much more likely to eat it. Even my two-year-old, he'll eat an onion and a mushroom if he helps me stand in the tower and chop it up. Does it make my day longer? Is it frustrating? Do I want to like, do I grit my teeth at him sometimes? Yes, but at the end of the day, I know when that meal is finished, he's actually going to sit down and eat it because he helped me play a role in it. And so sometimes we need to start at the source, which is we have to slow ourselves down just a little bit to make time for some of these things if we want them to really become part of our lifestyle. I'd also encourage you to eat your meals together. I know we're busy. We have two working parents. We have a hundred activities that kids are playing in after school. And again, it might mean there needs to be a change. It might need, once you make something a priority, it means it moves up on the list. I would encourage you to sit down with your partner, your spouse, or yourself and your children and make, have a family planning session. And say, what are our core values for this family? And if the core value is we wanna be in good health this year and we want to create traditions for the family, well then some things will probably have to go. But if you can agree on them together and make start making decisions in the right direction, a year from now you'll be a whole different family and you'll be better for it. Try to sit down and eat dinner together. If someone in your family became a very ill health, you would have to slow down. You would be forced to slow down and you would adapt. So why not why wait until that's the case? Why wait until you're being forced to slow down because of your health? Why not slow it down a little bit right now so that you can continue living a thriving, um, overflowing lifestyle? Okay. Instead of sugar, some things that you can start using. Pure maple syrup, raw honey, stevia, monk fruit sweetener, coconut sugar, Okay, I'll say it again. <laughs> Pure maple syrup, raw honey, stevia, monk fruit sweetener, coconut sugar, dates. Dates are like God's sugar he gave us. So they were like apples and oranges. And all of a sudden, if you start eating, stop eating all of the fake sugar and you start eating something like an apple, you're like, man, this is so good. And then when you eat fake sugar, you start realizing this tastes, this doesn't taste real to your mouth, but you have to give yourself a, uh, a period of making that transition. So what was a major tool for our family during the lifestyle transition with my husband's health shift was Pinterest. And you might laugh at that, but if you don't have the app, get it and then use it. Type in what I would recommend would be anti-inflammatory snack recipe, anti-inflammatory pizza recipe, anti-inflammatory breakfast options, anti-inflammatory three ingredients you know you have in your pantry, dinner options. And you will be surprised. This became one of the greatest tools we had because I made it my focus that we were not going to stop eating delicious foods just because we were making a lifestyle change. So it became a mission of mine. I mean, we're not gonna give all this up. We're just gonna find much cleaner ways to make it. And now more than ever, and with the help of a health, we don't have other options in this area, many at all, to be able to go get all the ingredients you will need. So anytime I meet with a client, it never fails. There is something on there that I'm saying, you have to go to the health hut for that. You've gotta to go to the health hut for that. Fermented foods, Go to the health hut for that. Prescription food brand they have there, write that down. Because I write it on everybody's paper anyway at the office. Prescription food brand, they make it in the strip district, I believe. So it's local. It's my favorite fermented food. 
of all the brands, and they have sauerkraut, and they have fermented garlic beets, and they have kimchi. Oh, I could just eat it by the jar. Fermented foods replenish the good bacteria in your gut. And everything is about that little ecosystem that's going on in there. We have an ecosystem in here and here on our skin, but everything starts in our gut. And so we want to make sure that we have more beneficial bacteria in there than negative, benefic negative bacteria. One of the best ways to do that, on, in addition to a good probiotic, would be every day eat a little bit of fermented foods. Get your kids to build a neural pathway to that so you can get them to eat some fermented veggies. I think I remember, Kelly, you telling me your, your grandchildren like sauerkraut or kimchi, and it can be stinky, it's a little bit vinegary. Start putting little bits of it on the side of each of your meals. For your children, adapt the slogan, crowd out the bad with good. You're not gonna magically wake up tomorrow and they're gonna stop asking for pizza and macaroni and cheese and all of the things. If you give them the macaroni and cheese on the side of that plate, make sure there is real food. Start crowding out the bad with good. It's almost, I like to consider it defensive eating and make your best available option. Make your best available choice. So if you're starving to death and on the side of the road there's a glorious McDonald's arch, eat the McDonald's. If there's a McDonald's in a restaurant that has a salad, go where you can get a salad. If you can go to get a salad or make a home-cooked meal, make a home-cooked meal. Give yourself a break, give yourself a little grace, make your best available option, and give your kids grace too. As you're going through this transition, it's, it's not going to be super easy, um, but it helps to do it one step at a time. Adding a handful of grapes into an organic, non-GMO, gluten-free cereal, which can still be very delicious, crunchy, the crunch is what the kid wants, put a handful of blueberries in there. Add real food to the fake food to start crowding out the crap with good food. Get some greens. Get some greens or a different color and make it their special drink. Put it on the counter and say, this is only yours. I have a little boy, his mom comes in, and she wanted, he will not eat a veggie for his life. And so she calls it his Hulk drink. He likes to play football, and that has become his Hulk, his Hulk juice. So every day he's, take, he's getting like five servings of veggies in, because she's giving him little bits of greens every single day. Adapt, adapt, find a way to squeeze it into the lifestyle for your family. Okay, where are we on time? Is it okay, I'm getting there. So drink more water, eat real food, air. Air is how we get oxygen to ourselves. It is, we breathe so shallow in the United States and we also have all this anxiety. Well, anxiety fuels the shallow breathing. The shallow breathing fuels the, the shallow breaths. And so, something you can start working on with your child every day and for yourself, because you'll benefit, is working on getting some deep breaths in. So when we walk outside, I tell my, I just say, you get your deep breaths in and he'll do his, we call it box breathing. So you inhale for five seconds, do it with me now. Hold it for five. Exhale for five. It will slow you down. It will calm your heart rate. It will bring oxygen to your brain. It will bring oxygen to your cells. Set your timer first thing in the morning, five minutes. Do some deep breathing for yourself and for your child. You will be happy that you did it. And if your child has trouble falling asleep before bed, do a little bit of it before bed. It's almost a bit of a meditation that will help them relax, quiet their brain, and help them fall into a pattern for sleep. Movement. We have to limit our screen time. We already know this, so how do we do it? How do we tangibly do it? I think it, the easiest way right now is to set a timer or say we're watching one episode, set the expectation. I think the issue is we generally have different expectations and we're not communicating our expectations. So if you tell your child you're getting to watch one episode of whatever blippy is what's on in my house right now, then we're moving on then that helps with it. Even if there's a minor meltdown, it usually lasts a little bit shorter period of time because you've already expressed um, the expectations. There's something called the alphabet exercise. If you go on Pinterest, again, you can type in alphabet exercise and each letter of the alphabet is connected to a different workout. So maybe A is five jumping jacks and B is five sit-ups and C is dance around for 20 seconds like a fool. There, you can have them each day say, we're gonna spell the day of the week plus your name. And that's a great way to make it fun, to get your child moving. Now that might not work for your teenager. Most of them are in some type of physical activity. For, for those of us with smaller children at home, it's a great way to start integrating movement into the day every day. Make it fun for them. Okay, let me see if I hit a little bit here. 
if you're not getting adjustments as a family, chiropractic adjustments, let me make a little pitch here. I have found, and my son's been getting adjusted since he was two days old, and I've been getting adjusted every two weeks since I found out I was pregnant, the whole way through. When you're, most of us look down at our phone a lot. We sit a lot for our job, we're sedentary. When our skull and our spine become compressed, we interfere with our information pathway information pathway or our nervous system of our brain into our spine. That's what tells our body what it needs and how to, where to send the resources. When that gets all crunched up, of course we stop being as efficient in our healing processes as we could be. Each time you get adjusted, it's not necessarily that the chiropractic adjustment heals you, it's that it opens up, releases some of that pressure and allows your body to send the healing resources where they need to go more efficiently. So I say, I don't I mean, I have a chiropractor that I love. I live in Elwood City. There's great chiropractors. There's a ton of great chiropractors in Beaver County. If you don't have one, test them out. Find one that you jive with, that you learn to love and trust with your own body and your children's body, and give it three months. See how you feel after three months of getting adjusted every few weeks um, if you're constipated, if you're having lower back pain, if your child has an ear infection, if you're starting to feel like you're coming down with something. All great signals to go get adjusted. Okay, supplement-wise, I recommend a great multivitamin, some type of probiotic slash digestive enzyme. Some of them are two in one. I'm not sure if you have some. You have something. Okay, what I would recommend is go into the health app and ask them what these this combo they would recommend: multi, a digestive enzyme, probiotic, and some type of immune boost. <clears throat> I think that biofarm has a really good immune fortifier for kids. And anything you can get in liquid is usually easier to hide it for the children or chewable, because you can crush that up if they don't like the taste, you can put it in a smoothie. But those are three great ways, especially as we're coming into the fall and into the winter and into, is there any, do we really think it's coincidence that Halloween into Thanksgiving into Christmas is flu and cold season? I mean, of course it is. We are no longer outside in the sun running around and then we're junking ourselves up with tons of sugar and giving ourselves the pass on all of the cookies and the pie and the cake. And so what I would say is, again, crowd out the bad with good this holiday season. Doesn't mean don't have the piece of pie, it means have the piece of pie, but also make sure on your plate you have lots of good food. Same for your child. Maybe for Halloween, yeah, pick 10 pieces or 15 pieces. I know there's kids in the room that are like, what are you saying right now? Take a few pieces, put it to the side and the rest you send it somewhere else. It's not serving anybody to be overloading on poison. Their sugar does not serve us in any way. It's one of the only things you could say, you can't pull anything good out of this one thing. So anytime we have it, we're willingly poisoning ourselves. We're, the whole country is hiding from a virus because we're afraid to get sick, but when it comes to food, we willingly and knowingly poison ourselves. It makes no sense. So let's, we have an opportunity to be like the top of the top right now because we don't have to live in fear and we can be overflowing with um, confidence in our build and the way that we're feeling. And we can touch the people around us that are not maybe feeling so confident in what's going on around us. Let us be the people that rise to the top during the season. And you can do that by cutting some of this poison out of your life. 100% would be great. Is it easy to do? No, so little bits at a time. And then use the honey and the raw maple syrup and the dates. There's a great, if you look up, if you just mix up date balls, look up date balls. Put dates in your food processor with some cashews and some coconut and just whip it up and make it into some little balls and that will be all the sugar you need in your life, I promise you. And maybe I'll give that out for Halloween this year. Probably like egg my house with uh, date balls. Okay, the last, I'm gonna finish up here on just a couple of things that tend to be what I have found with fellow parents with their children, issues that they're concerned about, as well as myself. Oh, and I wanted to recommend this book. If you don't own this book, get it, read it, give it to someone you love who has a child. It's called How to Raise a Healthy Child in Spite of Your Doctor. This was written in the 80s. It is the true as true could be. Everything still lines up. And anytime my son has had a fever, my husband has to sit down and read the fever section because it's a great reminder that We've been taught to fear the fever. So that's where I'll start. Fear the fever. What if, yes? Oh, 
It is by Robert Mendelssohn, M-E-N-D-E-L-S-O-H-N. He's a doctor, was a doctor. I don't even know if he's alive anymore. Okay, <laughs> fever. Your body innately has a fever to make your body inhospitable to whatever is trying to manifest itself as disease in your system. What do we do? We take Tylenol. What does Tylenol do? Tylenol interferes with our body's ability to create something called glutathione. And glutathione is our master antioxidant in our system. It's part of what our liver is designed to do is create glutathione. Tylenol impedes that ability. So I would say, grow your Tylenol roll. It's not serving you. It might mask some of the sirens from the fire alarm, but it's not gonna help at the actual source of the fire. Fevers are designed to make your body inhospitable. So what's the best thing you can do? Wait it out. Let the, fire do, let the fire do its job in your system. Let the fever do its job. When there's an issue with the fever, it's whenever if you go from 100 to 105 in two minutes. When it goes super high, super fast, sure, there's an issue there. There are some concerns that there might be some seizures that could happen. That's not generally what's happening. You can be at 102. You can be at 103. I've seen my son at 103. You read this book. It's a great reminder because the temperature of your of your fever does not necessarily indicate the level of your sickness. So being at 102 as opposed to 101 doesn't mean I'm extra sick because my temperature is a degree higher. It means for specifically what your body is trying to rid itself of right now, that's the temperature it's raising itself to to try to make you inhospitable to that germ or that bacteria or that virus. And I'll use this opportunity to say, our body comes into dis-ease or disease when two things happen. One, when we are toxic, so when all of our, when we're not moving all of our waste out appropriately, or two, when we are nutrient deficient. So if we can get a handle on those two things, you don't have to worry yourself. Make sure that you're eating real food, supplementing your deficiencies, drinking your water, moving your body, Moving your body, moving your body, that's how you move your lymphatic system. It doesn't have to be extra crazy, hardcore exercise. Get up and do some marching in place. Put on a song and dance to a song. Get a little rebound or a little mini trampoline and bounce on it. That will get your lymphatic system going. Wait out the fever. If they're very uncomfortable, your child is very uncomfortable. My, for my son, it's, he wants to nurse. So if you're still nursing, nurse away. Otherwise, give them a warmish bath, put some Epsom salt in there, help to try to make them, uncom uh, make them comfortable. <laughs> make, them un make them comfortable. If you need to, maybe lighten the layers of what they're wearing. Give them garlic, lots of garlic. Uh, we, do you have a tincture there with some garlic in it? I think, yeah. Those are great things to have on hand so that if and when the issue arises in the house, you don't have to run out to the health hut. Stop yourselves now so it's already in the house for those types of things. Because the second part is an earache. If your child starts feeling that they're getting an ear infection, best thing you can do is you probably have some type of garlic tincture. You can use the tincture right in the ear. You could also get some organic garlic and infuse it in a little bit of olive oil and drip it right into their ear. And that will help kill off any type of infection that's brewing in there. I feel like I'm overloading you a little bit. The last one I'm gonna talk about is for pain because that's what we say when we get rid of Tylenol. What are we going to use if my kid bumps their knee and then they're, you know, they feel like they're in pain? Go to the health hut, get some Boyron brand Arnica. That's what if my kid skins his knee, he just yells out into the universe, Arnica. He knows he needs it. It's a homeopathic pain relief. Get it, have it in the house so that when you need to turn towards something for pain relief, you can turn toward that or towards some turmeric. God gave us our medicine. Turmeric is the strongest anti inflammatory on earth. You can go get it at the health hut, have it on hand, so that when you need to turn toward pain relief, you have your arnica, you have your uh, garlic drops, you have your turmeric. Okay, I think I need to, it's 8.03. I've given you a lot of information here. Hopefully I haven't overwhelmed you. But I do want to leave you with just the reminder that we are called to honor the Lord with the way we live our lives. And so if there's one thing you take away, it's that remember that you were created by the creator. You are well made when you give your body what it needs, enough water, real food, movement, enough sleep, um, and you stop overloading it with toxins. It has the innate ability to heal itself. And the same healing that was available to my husband that I watched come to fruition is, av is available to you too. And if you do want to 
ever meet and do any type of consultation, my cards are on the back table. If you just have extra questions when we're done, find me online and send me some questions. I'd be happy to um, have a conversation with you. So thanks for having me, you guys, to help. But thanks for being here today.